Beginning with a basic file, so we have our two core functions we have set up and draw. This gives us a starting point, so we now have a generic base file. So everything we do is always going to be around that. Of course, we always need to determine our size. So for this, we can decide whether we want a horizontal or a vertical file. So I could choose something like 800, 500 if I wanted. So you can decide whatever size works for you. You can put it in. You can even declare basic background color just to start. And then run the file, verify that indeed you are working. Now that the base file is proven to work, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start adding in the different elements, the different pieces that I need. So I'm going to start out and first add the catcher into my project, and then I will add in the drop, and then I will worry about trying to find out if things are intersecting, and then we can add in multiple drops. But again, we do it in stages. We do iterations as we try and build it. The catcher is, of course, the easiest object to add into this, so this is the one I want to begin with next. Adding in the separate files as a alternative practice, I'm going to make all of those files right now just so it's done so I can automatically start putting the code into it so they are ready to go. So I'm going to need a catcher file, I'm going to need a drop file, I will need a timer file, and these are the three that will work with. Intersection is going to get wrapped either into one of the other class files or into our main file, and we'll explore the why and how of that in a little bit. So with that, I can now make my new files, and I can save this out. And I'll just call this one catcher.pde. Then I'm going to make a new file again, and then this one is going to save out as my drop.pde. And my final one that I need to complete this will be my timer. So now I have my different files all ready to go. I have my original game here. I have the catcher file, timer file, and drop file. None of those have content into them. I'll be migrating content from their files that we used in the previous class to complete those and then inside the game start tying them together and making them all interact with each other, which is where the real fun begins. So again, the catcher is the easiest one to bring into it, so I'm going to bring in the catcher. And catcher is already set up as a class. So if we look at catcher, we can see I have the catcher class. So with that, all I really need to do is just go grab the class portion. So starting with the word class, I'll grab class catcher. Now, a key thing about this is I was very careful with my naming to use capital letters to correspond to the capital letters that are associated with my classes. So that's really critical that the names all line up. So I'm going to grab these lines of code out of the previous catcher file. I'm going to just copy that, go into my brand new catcher file piece that I have, and paste that in. There is my catcher class. Now if I decide I want my catcher to look differently or to be colored differently or anything else, I can certainly update that information right now. Otherwise, right now the catcher will begin at the middle of my screen when it shows up, and then it will take on the X and Y position of the mouse. It will have a stroke of black, a fill of gray, and it will be drawn at this location and at that particular radius size. So I can save that and go back into my catcher game. And this is where I can add in a new catcher object. So now that I have populated catcher with something, I can go into my game file, my catcher game file, and I can say catcher. Now if, if I, I can call it whatever I want, I could just call it catcher lowercase c, I could give it a name, I could give it, you know, Fred, Sally, John, whatever works, or 
if it's going to represent something else, you've already conceived of an idea for your project, you can rename it appropriately as well. So I can say catcher is a catcher. And then I can say catcher equals new catcher. And the thing about catcher is catcher does require me to provide a size to it when it's being made. So it needs to know a size. So if we look in the catcher class, it's expecting a radius. So I have to decide at this point how big I want it to be, its radius. Do I want it to be a radius of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50? Depends really on how easy I want the game to be. Uh, but we are going to, for the purposes of this project, be dealing with circle-based um, collision detection. So if you choose to make your catcher object into something that is not a circle, know that the collision method we're using re is based on one circle intersecting with a different circle. So you can draw whatever you want in, but know that we need to be tied to the concept of it's a circle. Uh, the two more common methods of collision detection are either a rectangle-based or a tile-based collision method or a circle-based collision, and each have pros and cons. Circle is the easier math to figure out, so that's why we typically start with that. So I'm going to give mine a radius of 25. So that now creates the instance of my catcher object. Now if I want my catcher object to show up on screen, I still have to tell it to do so because if I run this, we'll see that, well, not a whole lot happens because while my project has a catcher object, I never told the program to show me that catcher object. So we have to say something like catcher dot, and what we could do is we could start out with update which now updates the position of the catcher. Looking in the catcher class, update says set x and y equal to whatever the mouse is. And then catcher has its second method of display. So catcher gets to update, catcher gets to display. And for the purposes of convenience and consistency, Every time we're constructing a visual object that we're going to be showing ourselves on screen, we're going to use update and display as our two primary methods. Update to update any position information or other updating that needs to occur with an object and display for the instructions of what do we want to see on screen. So we're going to be consistent with that so you're not always having to go back to the class and go, oh, what, what's the name of the method for updating? What's the name of the method of showing it up on screen? If we just get in the habit, update and display, and use that all the time, it makes it much easier when we're doing our coding because we don't have to think about, well, what did I call it this time? What did I call it that time? What was it last time? I don't know. And now if I run this, we'll see that that catcher object is indeed following my mouse wherever it goes. Now, the one difficulty that's occurring at this point is that my background is not cleaning itself off through each iteration. So as I draw every circle that was there previously is still there. Moving on to the drop and catching the drop. So currently our drop file is empty, so I need to go back into one of the drops from last week. So I'm going to grab the drop class. Now the drop class had an X and a Y and a color and a radius and a speed. Now ours are dropping vertically, so they're using speed Y. If you want your drops to move horizontally because you're going to design a different type of interaction, you might want to change the naming from speed Y to speed X. But that's up to you as you figure out your gameplay. Of course, you need to change that you're not modifying the Y property, but you would be modifying the X property of your object. So I'm grabbing the drop class out of the drop file from last week, or last class. So I'm grabbing that, and I'll go into my new empty, brand new empty drop that I have. Paste, puts it in, okay, there's my drop. So that puts a drop on screen. When a drop hits the bottom, it goes back to the top. 
and resets itself. Or it will. Oh, yeah. Now that we have the drop class populated, we can do something with it. We recognize that the drop will spawn itself at some location, uh, some random x, and it will start at a value of 20, and then it will start dropping. It has an update and display method. We're not going to worry about check bottom right now. We may or may not come back to it later on this evening. So I need to add that drop to my main file. I do it the same as I did with the catcher, and I can say drop drop then I can simply say drop is equal to new drop drop doesn't take a number or any parameters so I can just say drop like that and then we can just tell drop to update and drop to display so once I do that then when I run my file, I will see that the drop does drop. Now in this case, my drop is just falling down the screen. And if I close it and launch it again, we can see it should spawn at a new random X location and now it falls over there. The problem that I can't tell if the drop is still moving or going is because the drop, same problem I run into with the catcher. I'm not cleaning or painting over my background. Ooh, but if I do that, we can see, see? So then we, oh wow, it's like it's bleeding out. So clearing the background is something that we can just use our background command. We can clear the background with a color, we can clear it with white, we can do whatever we want. We can do it with a transparent rectangle so everything leaves a ghosting trail. We have all, you know, whatever option that we want. We can set up our cleaning the background into its own, fu or own function like we looked at doing on one of the previous assignments where we broke our logic and our draw into functions. But again, embracing the concept of iterative coding. We get something working and then we organize it to make it clean and efficient. But the first step is get it working. Once it's working, then we can go back and make it better. Make it more optimized, make it look better, make it function better. So right now I want to clear my background I'm just going to flood it with white. So I'll just say background 255, so that floods it with white. Now if I run the same project again, we will see that now when my catcher moves, it seems to be moving. I can see that my drop is now dropping. I don't get stuck with the one circle up in the top left corner. So now it starts to appear that it's behaving properly. Modifying drop to allow that to happen means all I have to do is change a number here. Currently it says 430, but I could say something like height plus, because height is now the size of the document that this is being loaded into, which in this case is 500. If yours was 400, then th that means it would work no matter what size my document is. And then I'm going to pad it a little bit by taking its radius to verify it's totally off screen because currently it will register it's drawing from it the middle of a circle so as it draws from the middle of the circle that means half of its radius is still on screen so we'd see half a circle on screen especially one going really slow so I'm going to say plus its radius or even if I wanted to go further I could say radius times four or some you know arbitrary value but that now says in this case that means when it's greater than the height of the document plus, in this case, 32. So it's now had a little bit of travel off screen. I also want to start it at a negative number so it starts above my document. So instead of starting at 20, I'm going to start it at a negative value of, say, something like I could say, use that same value of r times 4. Advantage of using the R times 4 is if I decide my drops need to be bigger or smaller, I change that R value, and now these starting location and ending locations work. Well, could you, could you and this one should also be changed as well. Because as I'm developing my project, I may decide that I want, instead of 8, I want it to be 12. Or I want it to be 20. And if I use values like negative r times 4, that guarantees it's off screen 
and before and after. So we are copying intersect from the intersection uh, file from last week. So just Boolean intersect ball A, ball B, which was version number two. But we're not copying any of the classes, any of the setups and draws or anything. All we want is that first part. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go into my game, paste that in. Now, as I've done this, it's going to be very close to being usable. We just have to change two words in it. Because this intersect function was built on the premise that we were having a ball intersect a ball. but our catcher game is a drop intersecting the catcher. So I'm just going to update that and say catcher and drop. So all I have to do is say catcher and drop. This allows me to use a function to determine if my two objects have intersected each other. Now that we have that intersect function, now we can actually check for collisions. So currently we'll just use an if statement and I can say if intersect now intersect is looking for two things. It's looking for my catcher and my drop. So if intersect is true, so calculates the distance and if the distance is less than the sum of the radii, remember the inappropriate uh, whiteboard drawing that goes with this, then that returns true, otherwise it returns false. So when this returns true, that means they're intersecting. So uh, I say if intersect with catcher and drop is true, then we need something to happen. So this is where I need to do something. And this doing something, this is where we need to figure out what is going to happen so that we can make it occur. In the beginning, to prove this, an easy way to do something is simply to send a message to us using the console. So we use print line and I'm just going to send a message of yes so when they're intersecting it's going to send out a message of yes now if I run this see nothing and as soon as they're intersecting you'll see yes appearing inside your console down at the bottom so while they're intersecting so that's proving that the intersection method is indeed working, but we need to do more than just have that happen. We probably need to make the drop reset itself, spawn at a new location, or you know, do something. So that's something we can now build into the drop. With intersection, it's printing out the message of yes. So hit go. When it intersects, yes, 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 no, yes, yes, okay. So it works. But it would be nice to do something a little bit better. So I'm going to get rid of that um, printing on there. And instead, what I'm going to do is tell my drop to do something. So I'm going to say drop, and I'm going to tell it to reset itself. Now, you may be thinking, that's great. I'm glad my drop knows how to reset itself. That's wonderful. I don't remember programming it, but sweet. That's beautiful. It well, it, the drop doesn't know how to reset itself yet, so we're going to have to teach the drop how to reset itself. And this is part of what we do to bring these pieces together. We have to teach it. So to do that, we have to add to our drop file a little bit. So. I'm just getting rid of all that. We're not going to use any of that check bottom stuff. I don't feel like that tonight, so it's gone. So drop has update and display. I deleted all the other crap out of there. I'm going to get rid of a few extra lines just so I can fit more stuff on screen. Move it up. 
So after display, what I'm going to do is add in another method to my drop, and I'm going to teach it how to reset itself. So reset doesn't return anything, so we use a void. And we can say reset, put in my curly brace there. And now at this point, I just get to tell the drop where to go. That's actually kind of fun. You know, I get to tell the drop where to go. And to do that, one thing that I could do with it is I could tell it to go to a new location. I could send it off screen. Currently, what I'm going to do is send it to a place that I can see, so I see it there, and I'm going to make it stop moving temporarily, and the, we're gonna change reset around a few times, but just to understand what is indeed happening with it. So I'm going to say y is equal to zero, and speed y is equal to zero. That means even if we keep telling the drop to update, its speed is zero, so it's not gonna, it won't be falling anymore. We killed its speed when we reset it. So this also means the drop will be half on screen and half off screen because we're setting its y equal to zero. So now that I have that, I have my catcher file. If they intersect, I tell the drop to reset. We're gonna make it a little bit more interesting with the resets in a moment, but again, we always want to prove something works before we get too big for our britches. So when I catch it, we can see it reset itself up on screen. Jumped up to the top position. So we proved that it can work with that reset. That's a pretty crappy reset. I think I'd rather make it, if I catch it, that I can do something else. So it works, but that's not very interesting. So I'm not gonna kill the speed anymore, but what would be more fun is to grab this kind of information where it resets it to a new X location, puts it off screen, and gives it a new speed. So it appears to be a brand new drop. So I'm going to just copy the information that was there, paste that here. So reset says set the X to a new random location, set the Y off screen, and give it a new speed. So every time I catch it, it will appear a new one is falling and it will be at a new place with a new speed. It's gonna be magic, I tell you. So we can see we've got a little speed demon here, but when I catch it, now the next one is falling slow. So it looks like every time I catch one, we get a new one falling on screen, and there it appears that it just keeps creating new drops, but it's the same one each time. One drop is working, one catcher is working, it's all good. Now I need my armada of drops. So it's going to be very similar to this, but we have to use that nice programming construct that we have called an array. So to do that, we're going to set up our array of items. We will populate that array with a number of drops, and then we will cycle through that array and say, all right, in that array, all of you drops update and display, then at the same time, we'll be checking to find out if any one of those drops has intersected. If so, we'll tell it to reset. So it looks like we just can't get out of this uh, rainstorm that's falling down upon us. Or we could change reset so once we catch a drop, it doesn't respawn. It just stays off screen and it hides itself so it's no longer moving so that it appears that we're kind of cleaning things up or picking up or doing. So we're going to have a number of opportunities at our disposal there. So to add in my array of drops, I just have to say drop, do uh, my set of square brackets, Oop, wrong key, get my square brackets there, and I can refer to this as drops with the plural. Uh, if having name of drop versus drops, the class name is drop, if there's too much similarity, feel free to modify your naming a little bit so you could call it my group of drops or whatever works for you. I don't really care. Uh, I prefer brevity in my naming schemes and typing because the fewer characters I type, the fewer typos I make. So for me that works, but your mileage will vary. 
kind of like those EPA estimates for our cars. The mileage will vary. All right. So now I need to populate this array of drops. So what I can do with this is sometimes it's nice to actually make a variable that's going to represent how many drops that I have and I assign that number um, because then I can just change it in one place right here and then all the rest of my code which is drawing upon that number updates itself and that can be a nice way of working with it. So I'm going to uh, add that in in a moment. I'm just kind of prefacing that's where we will be going. So I really don't need the single drop anymore so we can comment that out. I can now take that single drop and comment that out. And now I can say drops, which is my group of drops, is equal to new drop. And then I use my square bracket and I specify how many drops I'm going to use. And this is where I'm talking about the length of my array. How many drops do I want to have falling? It's nice to represent that with a variable, but I could hard code a number in right now and I could do something like 100. So and this should be drops where previously I had the single which was drop. Okay. So drops my array of objects is equal to a new drop square bracket and then 100 is how many I want to have. And then you to populate my array and to stick some more drops into it I can just simply say well, I can use my for statement and if I'm in sublime, sublime helps me out. If I'm in processing I have to type all of it out but I do something along the lines of for int i equals zero and then this length number here is really equal to my drops dot length. Now this is where when I said if we used a variable number to represent it so if I set up an additional variable up here like int number of drops like that I could now be just writing that in instead of using drops.length, instead of using the 100 here, and I would just change that number as I need it. Um, that is another way we could go about doing it, and there are some advantages to doing so, but it's not a bad idea to remember that we're going to cycle through based on how long or how many spots are in this array. Processing requires us to specify how many spots are in our array, and it does not get uh, very happy if we try to add spots to the array or take spots away from it. It likes to know that this is how many and you don't change that number afterward. It makes it happy. Some languages allow you to add and subtract to the length of an array dynamically and regularly and have no performance issues, but processing prefers that we once we specify an array has a certain number of objects, we don't change the number of spots within that. It doesn't want anyone budging in line, changing its precious counting, because then it gets grumpy. Now I can simply populate it by saying drops and then specifying which item in my drops. So drop size equal to new drop. And now that sticks a new drop in my array. So now that populates my array with drops. Now that my drops array is filled with a whole bunch of new drops, now I need to modify what I'm doing down here and tell those drops to update and display. So we can do that again using a, another for statement, identical to before. So I just say for and now I can go drops.length and now we're going to tell those drops to update and display and I can recycle what was used before with a slight modification. So these items can now simply I just do the bracket I bracket oh, and put S's on here. So the same way we said drops I is equal to new drop, now we tell that each drop to update and display and we're also going to then have to go through and find out if those drops are intersecting so we can even put this code in it as well. Yep. 
Just have to modify it a little bit. So we send the catcher and the particular drop we're looking at at the moment. So our original drop has all been commented out. Now we're using our drops array. And then we cycle through, we tell the draft update, we tell it to display, then we check and see if it's intersecting. This is also somewhere where we may wish to flip the order, say update, check for intersection, if they're intersecting, move it, and then say display so we don't run into where I could potentially have one frame where it is intersecting visually, it's on top of it before it disappears. Um, so, but whatever. Uh, Based on how this one's playing right now, it doesn't seem to be causing a whole lot of problem, but sometimes we do have to change that order, so we may wish to have display occur after we've checked for intersection. So we update position, check for intersection, and then we tell the drop to display at whatever its current location is going to be at that point. So all of our drop became drops. We cycle through this drops array using a for statement or a for loop. And then we exit by saying drops and use the square brackets with I being the way to access an item in an array.